Welcome to another episode of my wake up call. You know, in over 500 episodes, I think I can count maybe on it's up to two handfuls that I've had a guest back again. And Sam Horn was episode 33. And I was going to say she had me at hello, but she had me at hello when she and I met when we both attended something called Renaissance Weekend in uh, Charleston. And, uh, and I'm so pleased to have her back because she has a way of looking at the world and into the world. And she sees things and helps other people see things uh, that go from hidden in plain sight into neon light effective. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's probably saying, that's enough already, Mark. Uh, she's the CEO of the Intrigue Agency, a positioning messaging consultancy, and she helps people deliver and design TED Talks, keynotes, funding pitches, one-of-a-kind brands. She's also the CEO of Tung Fu Training Institute, a trademark communication skills approach that teaches how to give and get respect at work, at home, online, and public. She's the author of 10 books, multiple bestsellers, including Tung Fu, Pop, Take the Bully by the Horn, Someday is Not a Day in the Week. Uh, the Washington Post bestseller got your attention. Her latest book is Talking on Eggshells, and it's already received wonderful reviews from Publishers Weekly and luminaries such as Jack Canfield, Lynn Twist, uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner, John Mackey, who founded Whole Foods. And uh, she just speaks everywhere. And every time I listen to her uh, and I see people taking notes voraciously, I feel like telling those people, that's the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, you're as much as you're getting, there's so much more to her. And she's back. And and I'm so glad that she is. Hi, Sam. Hey, Mark. We are simpatico souls, Mark. And I'm really glad we have an opportunity to have one of our far-ranging discussions. And hopefully people will enjoy it as much as we do. Uh, I'm not a gambler, but I'd bet on that. <laughs> uh, so we have to deliver, Sam. Um, let's go. Let's go. So what I had mentioned to Sam is she, uh, you know, certainly we can talk about her her latest book, but I, I would like her uh, to talk about what goes in her mind and what she notices. One of my mentors, Warren Bennis, stole a quote from Saul Bellow. And the quote was, be a first class noticer. And noticing is active, whereas looking, watching, seeing is passive. You're an observer, uh, you eat the popcorn and you leave the movie. But a first class noter sees things and what they see, they can turn into amazing things. I had Tim Brown on, the chairman and former CEO of IDEO. And he it was, a, a I think, an industrial engineer. And in my introduction to him, I said, you're a first-class noticer, Tim. He didn't know what it was, except intuitively he loved it. <laughs> so so tell, us a, tell our listeners a little bit about your background uh, and, and how you came to notice what you notice in the world and see things that other people don't see and then convert it into something that is not just engaging, it grabs people by the throat. Well, first, thank you, Mark. And so we'll talk about a mindset and we'll talk about a skill set because I think there is a mindset of being a noticer first. And Mary Oliver said it very well. She said, instructions for a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it, right? And isn't that lovely? So, you know, it's what, six words. <laughs> and I think both you and I feel that life is a gift. 
and that we are surrounded by blessings if we will pay attention. And as writers and speakers, we're constantly in the state of awe and appreciation. And then we get to tell about it. We get to tell about it in a podcast or in a in a book or in a blog. And writers get to live life twice. So noticing is its own best reward. Uh, elaborate uh, on pay attention and be astonished. I, I love those. And, and the telling is fine. But what goes on in your head so that you pay attention and then, and what is free in your mind to be astonished, which is different than pay attention and see if you can sell it and scale it. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, you know, Mark, you and I don't roll that way. Is that um, so? And 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 you and I both love quotes, so I'll use other quotes because I think they're flagpoles for great ideas, right? And so Kierkegaard said that we can only understand our life backwards, but we've got to live it forwards. Hmm. And of course, Steve Jobs said his version of that, you can only connect the dots backward. You cannot connect them forward. I 100% disagree. And it's why I always take notes. It is taking notes is a way to notice, correct? Tangibly. It means that we are looking with an awareness and an alertness for what pops out, what gets our eyebrows up, what is interesting. We haven't seen that before. It's surprising. And you know that I helped start and run the Maui Writers Conference. And in 17 years, our best selling authors didn't agree on anything. Frank McCourt said, You have to write first thing in the morning. Pulitzer Prize winning Dave Barry would say, You know, I'm a night owl. I don't get going until after six. Do you know the only thing they agreed upon? Ink it when you think it, <laughs> right? And it's, it's Mark, it's why I carry this everywhere. I carry it when I go for a walk on a stream trail. I carry it when I go to a beach because it is a tangible way of always understanding that there are things around us that deserve to be written down because when they're written down, these are dots and they help us connect things forward. They help us pay attention and then they help us imprint it in a way that we can savor it and remember it and then use it instead of just have it pass us by and we never even noticed it. So so this is a conversation. So can I share my journaling story with you? But of course you can. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is volume uh, 257, 45,000 pages. Wow. <laughs> and the first one I wrote, I it was the day I graduated medical school after dropping out twice, probably for untreated depression. Wow. I didn't fancy myself a writer. Hmm. And I just took out a journal and the, my first entry there in June 1976 was, I can't believe I made it through. They have graduated a crazy person. <laughs> and then what happened is I I felt anything that I thought or felt or saw was worthy of writing down, even if no one else saw it. And uh and what would happen is what, what I realized is uh, if I express things into the world, there's a lot of naysayers. What are you gonna what are you doing with that? What are you wasting your time on that for? What's that for? Uh, I love my children deeply and my 40-year-old daughter, uh, who's very much pragmatic and you know, kind of, you know, you know, she's transactional and 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 feisty. And when she was six or seven and she saw that I was writing these things, she said, you know, dad, if you died, we could only get 10 cents a journal because they're used. Whoa. <laughs> and, and here's the interesting thing. She's 40 now. She would say the same thing now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, here, and here's the thing, which I think you'll appreciate. I can't read my writing because I'm a doctor. I have 45,000 pages of writing that's illegible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's the expressing of it. Mm -hmm. And then you said it perfectly. When I express things, I will, uh, I'll write down some heading for whatever I'm talking about in the notebook. And then when I keep 
coming back to it, I'll say, that's an article. That's a book. That might be able to hold my ADD attention long enough uh, to be something meaningful. And so I think it's the process of expressing it, putting it on paper, and uh, and I carry it with me wherever I go. Here's another funny anecdote, but then I want to make you the guest. Uh, so since since my journals are you know a little bit sizable, sometimes they're small. I usually tuck it in my pants behind me, you know, in the belt, you know, so I don't have to carry it. And I'm giving a talk to about a thousand people. I think it was an insurance company. And the book starts to slip. <laughs> and 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 so I start twisting my hips like I'm John Wayne saying, what do you think of that, Pilgrim? And uh, uh and the people in the front row are looking at me like, what is going on? And, and I'm talking like this, but I'm contorted. And then I think to myself, I've lost it. It's going. <laughs> and, and, and so I pause. Uh, I say, I need to pause. And then I reach down to my pant leg. I pull out the journal and I say, Yes, that is a book in my pants, but I'm glad to see you. Oh, <laughs> kudos, Mark. Kudos. Your and, whole life you've been waiting for that line. Oh, yeah. And then at the end, you know, we have a Q&A. And then I say, oh, before I leave, I have a question for you. Should I keep the book bit? <laughs> Can I keep the book bit? <laughs> you know, see, Mark, that's quick on your feet. You know, one of the many benefits of writing things down in the moment, because it is a tangible way of being an active noticer of the world and imprinting it in a way that it's there when we want to call on it. It'll be there waiting for us when we're ready for it, right? And not only is it kinesthetic, as you say, you know, Emerson said something to that, we must learn to watch the gleaming lights that flash from within, you know, the mind. Well, if they just flash across the mind, they're gone, right? They don't call them fleeting thoughts for nothing. So the kinesthetic process and act of writing it down imprints it and it keeps you quick on your feet because it really is a way of honing and developing that skill set of being able to, you heard that line, I'm glad to see you a long time ago, but it was there waiting for you. The circumstances came up, you connected those dots in real time and came up with the perfect one-liner. So that is exhibit A of why being a noticer, writing things down, elevates your ability to respond with something original and clever in the moment instead of just duh. You're absolutely right. And uh, uh, talk about your experience of how and when the dot, the dots combine and coalesce synergistically. Hmm. Boy, what a great question. Okay. Um, well, here's where I'm going to go with this is that um, I think here's what's top of mind. I think, you know, I helped start and run the Maui Writers Conference for 17 years. And what I will always remember is that we help people jump the chain of command. You could pitch your screenplay to Ron Howard. You could pitch your novel to the head of Simon & Schuster. It was unprecedented. Here's the thing, though, Mark, is that at the very first pitch session, a woman came out of her session with tears in her eyes. I went over. I said, are you OK? She said, I'm not okay. I just saw my dream go down the drain. And I said, what happened? She said, I put my 300 page manuscript on the table and the editor took one look at it and said, I don't have time to read all that. Tell me in 60 seconds, you know, why someone should read it, what it's about. And the dots connected in real time is that dreams, people's dreams were going down the drain. And the dot was that they did not know how in 60 seconds to get across the value of their project in a way people would value it and want to know more. So now these are, this is proactive dot connecting, Mark, and it's what both you and I do. 
we see a gap, a problem or need, we immediately think, I'm going to write about that. I'm going to research about that. I'm going to do a podcast on that. Because we don't just no notice the dots. We look for where there are needs or opportunities or gaps. And then we realize somebody ought to do something about that. I'm as much as somebody as anybody. I'm going to do something about that. And that's your next podcast or that's your next blog or that's your next book. It makes life so purposeful and meaningful because it is just constantly being able to, I'm going to think of a synonym for notice. We see something in the world and we realize we can do something about it that's additive. Does it get better than that, Mark? No, not at all. Uh, uh, since I'm not speaking, can I can I offer an exercise that I would love you to try? Uh, you know, when you speak at your next conference, let's do it. And it could be about you know you know this is an exercise in first class noticing uh, when we mm -hmm. take a break or uh, you know during the conference, uh, and you can come back to me. Here's the exercise. Uh, and you got to make sure you don't bump into people, but leave the room and just walk, you know, wherever you're walking and just notice what you notice and then find another place and walk backwards and see what you notice. Because when you walk forward, you're a telephoto lens, you're in control. Let's take the mountain. But when you walk backwards, you're a wide angle lens and the world reveals itself to you. And if you just the experience of, oh, my God, the world is revealing itself to me, mm -hmm. it, it you have the chance to experience wonder. <laughs> Whereas when you're walking forward, it's, you know, uh, it's that's fine. You know, I'll take charge of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And what you want to be able to do is experience wonder uh, without an agenda, with a beginner's mind. Uh, you want to re reignite in you the capacity for joy and wonder, mm -hmm. and and then try not to rush uh, to to uh, imprison it. Uh, I ge I gave a talk. I, I gave a talk for a year and a half called Steve Jobs Returns, and I had the turtleneck, I had the glasses on, and I played him coming back from the dead from 1996 to 2007. I think I did it about 15 times. And I said, the way Steve Jobs or Elon Musk think is they see the unknown as an adventure to dive into and live, whereas 90% of the world sees the unknown as a danger to be avoided. Yes. And part of that is because Steve Jobs and Elon Musk have the ability to spontaneously, just like a Prius, go from divergent to convergent thinking. They can think divergently in an unfettered way, and they notice things. Uh, Elon Musk uh, noticed, oh, there's batteries in laptops. Why don't we put one in a car? Steve Jobs went to Xerox Park and say, they got something called a mouse. They don't know what the heck they have, but why don't we go back and converge and make a Macintosh? And so... In fact, they're both such control freaks. That's one of the reasons they love doing drugs. You know, when their controlling personality was too prematurely convergent, they do drugs so they could get a little divergent. And uh, but that exercise is really the, the chance to uh, to tap into being divergent and curious. So, so I hope you'll give that a try because it's. Uh, I thought you'd like it. You know, Mark, once again, we're simpatico, is that uh, you may know I wrote a book called Concentrate. Stephen Covey gave the endorsement, said it was thought-provoking, masterful, etc. So for many people, uh, they can't concentrate, right? They can't focus. And so here is kind of just exactly what you did, a unpacking way to do something about that problem of not being able to focus. First is to understand, as you just said, our attention is where our eyes are, right? So if we're at our desk and here's a little, here's some bills we have to pay and here's a project, unfinished project and here's this whatever, all of that is in sight, in mind. No matter, no wonder we can't concentrate, right? So the tangible aspect 
Uh, everyone I talked to and interviewed for the Concentrate book, and these were top athletes, et cetera, they all have a ritual. Every golfer, every tennis player, every musician, every surgeon, they all have a prep ritual that drops them into that focus zone, right? So our ritual can be, if we're sitting at a desk, to simply figure out what is the one thing we want to focus on, take our arms and literally move everything else on the desk out of sight, out of mind. Now, your lovely language, I've never heard anyone use those words, but you are right. Now we're, we're still in wide angle focus, every people walking by. Guess what? We use our hands as blinkers, right? Just as a horse has blinkers on. If we want to focus on one thing, telephoto focus is like move everything out of sight, out of mind. Put your hands on the sides of your face. It becomes a physical ritual to drop you into that state of focus on that one thing that's in sight, in mind, instead of everything else that's now out of sight, out of mind. Well, you know, something I'm trying to teach the world because I am a suicide prevention specialist mm -hmm. is, you know, if there's someone in your life and you're worried about, um, look into their eyes and say, where does it hurt? How much does it hurt? Take me to the last time it hurt so much you didn't know how you were going to make it through. And it's always there, Sam. If you give people, if, if you reach into them and listen for the hurt, and they see you're not going to minimize it or rush away, if you're listening to this and you try it, they're going to start crying. And don't panic. You let them cry. You didn't make them cry. And, and if they start to cry, uh, instead of getting anxious, uh, they're going to be feeling relief. And, and if they have trouble crying, and a lot of times our spouses and our teenagers are so depressed they can't cry, if you have this conversation and they cry a bit, you know, they're going to expect you to jump in and it's going to be okay. And uh, uh, we'll get through this and all those. And that's okay. Actually, it's not okay. What you should say if they have trouble crying is, I think you're holding back. Wow. Can you picture that? And what happens is, I'm going to start crying now because it's the tip of the iceberg in them that they live with. And you don't rush them. You just have to notice that they're crying. They're feeling relief. Now, it may be difficult for you to listen into it because you have your own trauma that you never dealt with. And you have your own hunger to somehow cry it out. So you, you may get a little nervous, but give it a try. Give it a try. You'll, you're you going to save a life. Wow. You know, Mark, you are the master at this. Look at your book behind you about just listen or, you know, dealing with the crazies or whatever. It's just that you, when, when we were talking before we started officially, I'm juxtaposing what you said, right? People say, how does your brain work? I juxtapose everything. I think it's the quickest way to make complex ideas crystal clear. And you are here, you are here to heal the hurt. And over on the left is hurt. And uh, over on the right is help and heal. And you are a master at saying something that people never would think of. And it is the perfect thing to say in that situation. You know, if we're gonna juxtapose this over on the left is advice, right? And, and as you said, when people are upset or sad, often we try and comfort them and console them by saying, it'll get better. We've all been through this, you know, look on the bright side. And as you're saying, Mark, that shuts them down. And instead to say is like, where does it hurt? And then when they talk about it to once again, as you said, not rush in to rescue them. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's like everything, you'll know, you'll see that, you know, and it, it, we've all been through this or none of those platitudes or cliches. Your next question is like, I think you're holding back is this incredible permission 
for them to stay with it and go deeper instead of you said minimizing it you know rushing off and then the double jeopardy of that is that they dared to trust you and be vulnerable and reveal and it got minimized or advised or rushed off and then they're a lot more reluctant to do it again aren't they Absolutely. Because when you say, oh, it'll get better, whatever, what they hear is, uh, looks like mom or dad has heard enough. Wow. And I haven't started. <laughs> and then what happens is they feel teased, you know, mom and dad, I know you love me, but you just did a bait and ditch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, book title. <laughs> oh, bait and ditch. Please tell me more about that because it's such an intriguing concept. Well, uh, there's a wonderful quote called, uh, he, he has cultivated the art of the empty gesture. <laughs> and the art of the empty gesture is, uh, oh, I was in your city, I thought to call you. And you're expecting them to say, oh, that's very nice of you, but it's the art of an empty gesture. It's, it's, it's uh, frustrating. It's annoying. <laughs> I was going to get you a birthday card, and then I thought, oh, who cares, who cares about birthday cards anymore? <laughs> yeah. I was eating your favorite food, and I thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could go on, Mark. We could <laughs> Hey, can we circle back to something you said? It was so fascinating. You were talking about Elon Musk and uh, other visionaries who see the world as an who see the world as adventurous, not dangerous. And you had asked a while back, you know, okay, where did this get started? What's the genesis, the origin of it? I was very fortunate. I grew up in Southern California on a horse. And even when I was seven and my sister was eight, we would be gone all day long on our horses. Mm -hmm. And our parents did not warn us or worry about us. They did not go, oh, what if something goes wrong? They thought, get bucked off, figure it out. Bridal breaks, figure it out. So guess what, Mark? They trust that instead of worrying that something might go wrong, they understood that things might go wrong and that we would figure it out. And that's why we see the world as an adventurous place, not a dangerous place, because the unknown and the uncertain is like, hey, when we get to that, we'll figure it out, right? Absolutely. You know, it's uh, uh, it's what I call uh, retrofitting your personality with basic trust. <laughs> because Eric Erickson talked about the psychosocial levels of development. And at, the, mm -hmm. and, and, and at the very foundational is basic trust versus basic mistrust. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a sense of basic trust, the world's a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you, you have basic trust, you step into the world. I remember I was speaking to Warren Bennis about leaders and managers, and we had a great conversation and, and the net net of it is we agreed Leaders go where they're looking. Managers look where they're going. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Okay, so so drill down. That's evocative, and it's lovely juxtaposition of phrasing, et cetera. So now, what are the connotations of that? The, the connotation of going where you're looking is that you trust your curiosity uh, you you trust that the world wants to reveal itself to you. And when you go where you're looking, it will. Uh, here's an exercise. I, I, I give away exercises, you know, uh, uh, this one you can try if you like it. With an audience, you say, I want you to imagine that your personality is a circle. And in this circle are the parts of your personality that are trying to prove, show, hide, or please. Prove, show, hide, or please. Now I'd like you to imagine eliminating all of those, what's left. And a lot of people will say nothing. Wow. To, to which you say, well, then you are leased out to the world. 
But if you can go for a long walk and just intentionally in your mind, let go of proving, showing, hiding, or pleasing, you may discover that your calling has been calling you for decades, but it kept getting a busy signal. <laughs> okay, truth bombs, folks. I hope I hope people are writing down what you're saying, Mark, because you you say things in like two minutes that are so profound. They are tip of the iceberg ideas. It's like you could you could unpack them. You could delve into them. There's so much uh, depth and breadth in them. So okay, so proof, show, hide, please, and and now let's come over with the four on the right. I think notice is one because mm -hmm. it does not have an ego or impressing or proving to it. You know, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share one and then you share one. Okay, receive, mm -hmm. receive over on the right. Okay, so we have notice, receive. What's another one from you? Opposite of prove, show, hide, or please. Well, I'll give you another acronym because I, I sometimes speak to marketing departments and I say, here's the formula that Steve Jobs and Elon Musk unconsciously follow. Mm -hmm. And the formula mm -hmm. is, whoa, wow, hmm, yes. W-H-O-A, <laughs> W-O-W, hmm, yes. And what does that mean? Uh, Elon Musk sees a battery in a, a laptop. Steve Jobs sees the mouse at Xerox Park. Woe is I can't believe what I just saw. Mm -hmm. Wow is that is astonishing, unbelievable, amazing. Wow. Hmm, this is too good to ignore. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Yes sold so when i played steve jobs coming back from the dead and if you're listening to this do a search on the internet for xerox park steve jobs national geographic and you'll see a one and a half minute video of a dramatization of his going to xerox park with steve wozniak and laying his eyes on the graphical user interface in the mouse and if you look at the expression on his face, Steve Jobs, he's back there being cynical like this. I'm Steve Jobs. They can't teach me anything. He looks at the mouse and he goes, that's the woe. And then he says to the technician, can I try it? And he sits down and he starts to sweat. And that's the wow. Then he looks back at Wozniak, because Wozniak was kind of the thinker. And, and and Wozniak's in the clip, you know, in the video clip. And yeah. he said, when Steve looked at me, I said, once they go there, they're not going back. And then uh, uh, the guy who wrote uh, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, he's at the I Aspen, think... Walter Isaacson. Okay, Walter Isaacson. So he, so he comes in uh, and he says, they didn't know what to do with this at Xerox, but Steve Jobs knew they had to do something with it. And they went back to Apple and created the Macintosh. But you can see so starkly the whoa, whoa, hmm, yes. So when I've consulted or coached marketing teams, I'd say, this is what he created with the Apple store. This is how you make a presentation. You know, it's, uh, it's an iPod. It's an internet connecting device. It's a telephone. It's an iPod. It's an internet connect connecting device. It's a telephone. These are not three devices. I give you the iPhone. Hmm. That's a whoa, wow, hmm, yes. <laughs> well, Mark, see, you're you're doing a wonderful job of explaining why my business is called the Intrigue Agency, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that what did I notice in all those pitches? Is that I could predict who was getting a deal without hearing a word being said based on one thing, the eyebrows, right? Because mm -hmm. if the decision maker's eyebrows are crunched up, like right now, everyone listening, watching, crunch it, we feel confused, right? We don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Confused people don't say yes. Now, if the eyebrows are unmoved, it means they're unmoved or they've had Botox. And just as you're saying, <laughs> you know, if we are intrigued, if we are curious, if we haven't seen this before, if it like amazes us, surprise, up go the eyebrows. It is the most tangible sign of what you're talking about right here. 
It's now, can we circle back once again to something that you said? We were talking about those four words that are the opposite of prove and show and hide and please. And we have, and, and one you've already, you were talking about, and you know what it is? Trust, right? Because see, trust has no ego in it. It is, it is a partnering with planning. And do we have time for a quick story, Mark? Oh, we have plenty of time. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for allowing me to compete with you. I'm talking as much as you are, and you're the guest. Go ahead. Mark, nope, no. We talked. This is one plus one equals 11. It is from the first time we met. This is like a fantastic tennis match. And we, we up our game when we play with someone who's better than us. And so I'm up in my game, you're up in your game because we both love this and we're both good at it. And it's, it's, it's like an intellectual Disneyland. So please keep doing what you're doing because it's, a, it's fun. So tell the okay. story. I want to hear the story. Go ahead. Okay. I am watching uh, CBS Sunday morning and they're interviewing Gavin DeBaker. And uh, he's a security consultant. And I tell you, Mark, the reporter asked a brilliant question that fast forwards people to a wow, well, yes, right? The reporter said, okay, as a security consultant who gives security to politicians and celebrities when they're traveling, what is something surprising that you've discovered? Is it? They just up leveled the question. Surprising, right? And he thought about it. He said, if anyone is ever assaulted or kidnapped, and when we get them back, we always debrief them. He said, you know what my first question is? Did you have any warning? Guess what they all say? I knew something was wrong. But then their intellect overruled their intuition. They said, they would look around, I'm in an armored car, it's broad daylight, what could happen? You know, I've got a security detail, I'm being silly. And I had an epiphany, Mark, I thought, if we have instincts that alert us when something's about to go wrong, don't we also have instincts that alert us when something's about to go right? And if we have a sixth sense that warns us of dissonance, don't we also have a sixth sense that notices resonance? And I think kind of the contrast, the opposite of prove and show and hide and please, is a combination of what we're talking about. It's noticing what's going on in the world and being alert to resonance, right? What are congruent opportunities? What are people that we're compatible with? What you used the word before, calling. What is calling us, right? That's our best future, meeting us halfway. And if we align then that, then we set up our serendestiny and things just get better and better from there. I love that. So, uh, so I have to share an anecdote with you because we're just we're on a roll here. Uh, if you're listening in, uh, there is a documentary called Mister Rogers and Me, and it's not any of the famous ones. It's not the one with Tom Hanks. It was done by I think a late thirty-something who lived next to him on Nantucket, and they formed a relationship after uh, after uh, he had retired. And there were a couple things that Mr. Rogers said that have just haunted me in a good way. Uh, he said, better to be deep and simple than shallow and complex. And one of the problems with a lot of consulting firms, some of the big names, is they're shallow and complex, but they have to show, look at all the research we've done. The research shows A, B, and C. And what happens is the end user smiles out of respect and implements nothing because <laughs> it's too complicated. So you have a way, I think I have a little bit of a skill of saying something that's deep and simple, meaning, meaning it's graspable. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a term I think you'll like because you, uh, and you're welcome to it. Uh, there's a difference between being using experience near language and experience distant language. Hmm. And so when I was with suicidal patients, when I would use experienced distant language, cl clinical, abstract, and I'd look into their eyes, they would disengage. So I had to, I had to develop a sensitivity for like, like for instance, uh, how uh, are you depressed? How long have you been depressed? 
that's different than what hurts. Where does it hurt? Tell me about when you couldn't take it anymore. And when you're crossing departments or silos, uh, what's experience near language is something you can feel and understand at the same time, whereas experience distant is something you have to think about and maybe agree with. And since the world is overwhelmed, they don't have room to think about it. So I thought like deep and simple is really visceral. Here's something else he said, uh, which got triggered by the last thing you said. And it's haunted me. And, and maybe this is maybe this is what I'm doing. He said, we have the power to love other people into being. I mean, just taste that. We have the power to love people into being. One of the things I've told people who are famous, I said, you know, uh, when you're Bruce Springsteen and, you, and someone thinks you looked at them in the audience, you have the power to give people a taste of going from a nobody to a somebody in an instant. And you need to use that power to do that. What a generous form of noticing, right? Is that uh, people have heard a lot about the great resignation over the last couple of years with tens of thousands of people leaving their jobs. Why? Number one reason, they're not, they're not seen, heard, or understood, or valued, right? And so, you know, well, yeah, why was Mr. Rogers so pivotal for so many young children? And, and I'm painting with a broad brush here. He was in the, he was in the age of latchkey kids, right? <laughs> for a lot of kids, they came home to an empty home. You know, mom and dad were working. And yet there was Mr. Rogers, loving, kind, and guess what, Mark? Patient. Mm -hmm. Remember you talked about rushing and, you know, clock is ticking, hurry up, got to go, not now, later, you know, that's the norm for most kids with parents, right? It's like, you know, whether it's soccer practice, piano lessons, get to school, grab your backpack, it is a constant state of impatience. And the long tail of impatience is, I've got more important things to do than you, and you better hurry up because you're annoying me, Right. And so for Mr. Rogers to be kind and patient and to listen, and, you know, he got down at their level, right? So he could see eye to eye. And for them, as you just said, they felt like somebody instead of nobody who was always getting in the way, always late, always a pest, always interfering, always causing their parents to be impatient with them. Wow, powerful. Yeah. I'll share a Warren Bennis anecdote because I miss him almost daily. And I, I remember when he turned 80, we were having lunch and he said, you know, they did a big tribute to me and David Gergen uh, ran it in Boston and Howard Schultz was there, uh, Jack Welsh. And he, and he leaned over to me and he said, I usually don't particularly like people making a big fuss about me. And then he looked, uh, see if the waitress is listening. And he said, but I really liked it. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, Warren, something you may not know about yourself is the only thing that people feel greater than respect for you is their love for you. And one of the things that people like Howard Schultz and David Gergen love about you and it's something, after I met you within 30 seconds, people can trust you to not hurt them. Wow. And that doesn't mean you suffer fools gladly. You're not a Pollyanna. And I said, people like Howard Schultz and David Gergen, they don't have anyone they don't trust, including themselves. And Warren looked at me. He scratched his chin and he said, you know, Mark, I'm getting a lot of tributes. A lot of things being said about me. That's the third best thing I've ever heard. And I can't remember one and two right now. 
<laughs> Which is why Warren Bennis was Warren Bennis, that he had a way of saying things, right? So, you know, Mark, you just used in a very important word is that uh, when my son Andrew was 30, his girlfriend Mickey gave him a party and she thought, all right, I don't want just this to be any party. I want it to be special. So how can I make it special? And she said, I thought, oh, I know. I'm going to get in, front, in touch with his friends and family, and I'm going to ask him to put together a 60-second video of something that Andrew said or did that made a difference to them. And she cobbled it together, and then she presented it to him on the rooftop of a New York uh, you know, building, et cetera. I called him the next day, and I said, so, Andrew, what was it like? He says, great. I said, no, Andrew, what was it like? And he said, mom, I can't believe that most people go their whole life and they never get anything like that until they die and then it's too late. So Andrew founded a company called Tribute. <laughs> and look at that word, big fuss. Mark, we have been taught, don't make a big fuss, right? Compliments, uh, don't make a big fuss. Thank yous, don't make a big fuss. You know, someone telling us what we mean to them, don't make a big fuss. We have been taught to reject that, that it's egotistical, narcissistic. And as a result, people go their whole life and it's only at their funeral that people have permission to say what they did to warn. And so this whole, I hope Andrew's motto for his company tribute is, remember the saying, uh, well, it's, if you have anything nice to say, say it all here, right? Mm -hmm. Make a big fuss for people right? Tell them what they said or did that made a difference for you. Don't wait until it's too late. It is at the core of how we can notice and then express it. You know, was it Walt Whitman and said that that receiving a gift and not opening it it's like, how's that phrase go? Somebody Google it, right? Because it's like, it's like to feel gratitude and not express it is like giving a gift and not unwrapping it. Or I'm I'm not doing a good job with that quote. However, I I, I can imagine you get the gist of it. Oh uh, yeah. Occasionally, I mean, you know, Warren was loving, but he wasn't necessarily effusive. And occasionally he would give me a really big compliment. And because of one of my imposter issues, I'd go neurotic on him and he'd say, Mark, when someone says something nice to you uh, that, you know, and they're not just, and they're being sincere, there's only two words that you say and two words only. And those two words are thank you. Anything more than that, and you're being high maintenance, and they're not going to want to give you another compliment. <laughs> I tell you, another truth bomb. And by the way, these are not spelled truth bomb, B-O-M-B. -B. These are truth bomb, B-A-L-M, right? They're a bomb for the soul. Is that, is it how simple, how, how could it be clearer from this day forward? You, me, everyone listening to this, we're making a vow to each other, Mark. If somebody pays us a compliment, we will say two words. Thank you. Because anything more than that is high maintenance. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and here's something you can share with Andrew. Uh, 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 you know, I do a fair amount of work on suicide prevention, and I partner with someone whose 14 year old son killed himself. And he's created a documentary that I've been looking for for 25 years. It's called What I Wish My Parents Knew. Wow. And he interviews 10 teenagers about their low point. And, uh, and when we're about to present, the documentary, I say to the parents, I say, write down these five words, complain, blame, excuses, threats, moody, complain, blame, excuses, threats, moody, because that's the language of most teenagers. And it triggers parents into being reactive instead of empathic, which is why they don't open up to you because they don't perceive that you can be empathic, but they don't realize that they've triggered you. So these 10 teenagers, they just calmly talk about their low points and how they could never tell their parents. And one of the things we do, now it may be a selective audience because uh, Jason Reed's an entrepreneur and we'll talk to audiences of entrepreneurs, but this is something that Andrew might use. I'll say, how, raise your hand if you can remember fewer 
than five times in your entire lifetime with your parents, but especially your dad, when you were both totally open, emotionally raw and vulnerable. And 80% of the audience raises their hand and many of them will say, I can't remember once. And, and it's a real shame. I mean, my, uh, my dad, was a workaholic. Uh, he retired. I think he got depressed. Then he got Alzheimer's. And I can only remember one moment, and he won't remember it because he had Alzheimer's. And it's when I was visiting him, and he was frustrated because he was a he, he was a, you know kind of a photographic memory. And Alzheimer's, if you have a photographic memory, is just it's just torturous. And here's the one moment I can remember. Uh, he was trying to put on his bedroom slippers and he kept confusing the left and right foot. And I tried to help him and he said, leave me alone. I can do it. I can do it. And uh, and again, he, would, he tended to be a critical person. But by this time, you know, he wasn't quite there. And he gets them on and he gets them on correctly. And he smiled at me like a young child learning how to do something proud of himself. And he smiled. And I said, that's great, Dad. You did great. And I'm just sharing this because I don't think it's that unusual. And it's not for lack of wanting. It's for lack of knowing how to do it. And, you know, granted, Andrew's, is a po Andrew's sight is a positive one. And I'd be happy to speak to him. But when you bring that up and you ask people, um, at the end of your life, uh, how many times can you count that you and one of your parents, especially the one who was a little bit more aloof, connected emotionally? Mm -hmm. And it's tragic mm -hmm. to not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't wait for that. You know, Mark, uh, so you, I, I love the organic evolution of our conversations. They're like string of pearls, right? Just one pearl leads to another pearl, which leads to another pearl. And they make this lovely necklace conversation. So you're bringing up uh, these meaningful conversations. And so uh, this last weekend was not, I'm not exaggerating, one of the best weekends of my life. And one was that Andrew had a birthday party and was surrounded by people. And I'm going to tell a story about that in a second. It's just, I also, my son Tom was here and my grandkids were here. And we had probably the most free-flowing stream of conscious conversations we've had in at least a decade. And the reason was we were side by side. See, you know, we drove to SeaWorld. We're side by side, right? We're walking on the stream trails side by side. And I wrote about it because uh, talking on eggshells is about having hard conversation. And Tom is a NASA scientist. And he said, you know, mom, my friends and I would like to know how to have easy conversations <laughs> because like, give us a blueprint. We're great. You know, give us in, in chit chat, social situation. It's intense. It's awkward. We just don't want to do it. And we talked about eye to eye combat. And when you are across the table from each other at a date or in an interview or at a meeting, as you well know, you're literally and figuratively op opponents. You're on opposite sides of the table. And to loop back now to like, if people are thinking, I would love to have an open, raw, real, vulnerable conversation with my parent or with my partner or with a friend, go for a walk side by side or go for a drive because it frees up the eye to eye intensity and it allows you now, you literally and figuratively have the same point of view, you know, and you're looking out at nature, you're both looking ahead and you are aligned physically and psychologically. And it really does allow us to, to overcome self-consciousness and to tap into stream of consciousness. Is that what you find too? You know, I, here, I, I got a volley with you. We're having a volleying match because when we give these presentations, you know, parents want to hear tactics. What can we do? Give us a tactic. 
And I, uh, uh, and there's something that I call the four prompts. And you do this when you're driving with your teenager mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you're not having eye to eye contact. And so you're not intrusive. And I said, look, teenagers can't stand eye to eye contact or heart to heart conversations that they don't initiate. It is nails on a chalkboard for them. And so, uh, the prompts, which they like, you're driving in a car and you say to your teenager, you know, a lot of us parents are worried about our kids. You know, we, we just hear about everything. We hear about social media. We hear about bullying. We hear about the news. And I'm one of those parents. Can I just run a few things by you? Would that be okay? And again, you're not intruding on their space. And hopefully they'll say, okay, ma, what is it? Or, okay, dad. And here are the four prompts. The first one is, at its worst, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life or yourself? Wow. And they go, what? Yeah, at its worst, how awful are you capable about feeling about your life or yourself? Pretty awful. And I have an approach called surgical empathy. And you say, pretty awful or very awful? Okay, mom, very awful. And you get them to talk about that. Second prompt, when you're feeling that way, how alone do you feel? Wow. Pretty alone. Mm. Pretty all alone. Mm. Okay, okay, all alone. And you get them to talk about that. Third mm. prompt is take me to the last time you felt it. Wow. There's something magical ha happens when someone can describe something so clearly that you see it, they refeel it, but they're not alone. Was it 2.30 in the morning when you were walking around the other night? Wow. We heard you in your bedroom. Yeah, what was going on? I couldn't get to sleep. We heard that. Yeah, what was going on? Wow. Well, I had a test the next day. I couldn't get to sleep, and I couldn't get to sleep. So what would you do next? I felt like kicking the wall or punching the wall, and I didn't do that. And What would you do next? Well, I started looking for cough medicine. Couldn't find it, and that sounds awful, and What'd you do next? Well, the sun rose and it was okay. And the fourth prompt, if you're lucky, you've earned the right to have eye contact and you pull over to the side of the road and you may have pulled over to the side of the road during the prompts and you say, look at me. And they'll look at you and you say, I have a favor to ask you. The next time you're feeling that way, so awful about your life or yourself and you're feeling alone, or even if you're just heading in that direction, I want you to do whatever it takes to get your mom or your dad or my undivided attention. Because we're so busy, we're, our minds in a million things, but there is nothing more important uh, than helping you feel less alone when you feel that way. So will you do me that favor? And also, if you think it would be a burden to tell us, uh, uh, if you get our undivided attention to do that, it's not a burden because in 20 years, if you have kids and you're fortunate enough to have them open up to you like this, it's a gift. So I just had to share that with you. Mark, I really see this is why we record is because this is timely, timeless wisdom. I cannot imagine anyone hearing this without immediately thinking of someone they want to reach out to and someone they think, oh boy, they've been getting a lot of not now, hurry up, catch you later, you'll be better. It's like, oh, you don't have to worry about that test. You're smart. You you know, you're getting straight, straight A's, you know, all of those things. And the irony and the tragedy Mark, is we are not taught these things, as you well know. You know, we have math and science and history, and no one teaches us what you're teaching us, which is really the, the end all of, of a well-lived life with the people we love. It's um, one of the things I was, why I write down are the words that you're using. You're using uh, undivided attention. You're using, can I ask a favor? You're using, you know, awful and alone, and you're using a phrase, what did you do next, which takes them deeper. It's like, so you are giving people 
the tangible talk tools in order to do what they want and they simply don't know how. So can I give you two of my, of my favorite examples that, that follow up? So we're back on my son, Tom, here this weekend and I'll tell an Andrew story. We're out on the stream trail. Hey, it's almost a summer day. It's Austin, it's getting pretty warm. We've been out there for a while. So one of the kids starts whining. I'm hot, I'm tired, how much longer? Can we go home, <laughs> you know? And now, do you know what my son Tom did? He stopped and he he could have said, well, catch up or you're ruining our day. Or, you know, it's like, you know, we were gonna, you know, and he didn't any of that. He said, I've got a question. He said, how fast can you run? Like slow, fast or medium, fast or like really fast? I'll race you. And then he took off. Mark, guess who took off after him? Guess who caught up with him? Guess who ran ahead of him? Guess who 60 seconds later was happy, having fun, <laughs> smiling, etc. I thought that is one of the best examples I've ever seen of a pattern interrupt. He did not shame them. He shaped them, right? It's like he got their attention. He modeled the desired behavior instead of the dreaded behavior. He didn't make him feel bad. You know, it was like in 60 seconds, he transformed it. And so you want one more example, and then I can't wait to hear what you say about this. So then I'm visiting Andrew in New York and uh, we're getting caught up in the living room and one-year-old hero crawls across the floor and there is a, is a guitar over on the stand there. He pulls himself up on the guitar stand. He starts pounding on the strings. Now, Andrew could have said no. He could have said, you know, uh, he could have yanked the guitar away. He could have said, leave the guitar alone. He didn't say any of that. Do you know what he said? One word. Gentle. Mark, mm. I saw Hero's face transform. And he reached back to the guitar, he went strum, strum, strum. He reached up to some bells on the window, ring, ring, ring. And in that moment, Hero made music. And it's because Andrew and Tom both modeled what you're talking about. How in the heat of the moment can we really say things that connect and that transform behavior in ways that are in integrity and that that well take it from there mm -hmm. well i think what happened is he was gentle not just in the word but he was gentle in the space he was uh uh not being critical not being shaming uh, it reminds me of something a friend of mine who was a rabbi used to say to his children when he said you know when they would do something or they'd misbehave and and you interact with them, they knew they'd already done something wrong. You know, they, 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 you know, and they were all set for a lecture. And one of the things he would say, now you have, this is out of context. And so they were expecting, you know, some lecture, something, you know, uh, 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 that that's the wrong thing. And he would say to his children, uh, that's not who I believe you to be. Wow. I don't think it's who you believe you to be. It was so eloquent and elegant. Mm -hmm. I don't I, I don't know why you just triggered something. So here's another tactic that I give people. Mm -hmm. It's uh uh I, I'm gonna write a I'm writing a column on you know for a probably for entrepreneurs, and it's going to be called uh, Millennial Married with Kids Displaced Anger Syndrome. <laughs> okay, I got to hear about that. <laughs> because what happens is a lot of millennials and younger marriages are with couples who are, they're impatient because of the technology, and they didn't realize how much patience an infant needs. Mm-hmm. And often the mom who may be working, but she's doing the lion's share of interacting. What happens is when the child won't sleep, the child won't eat, the child won't finish, and she has to go make a call. 
she doesn't want to own the fact that she's not just frustrated, but angry with her child. And instead, she displaces it onto the husband who is like Bambi coming in, you know, from the forest and the hunters shoot him like, and, and, and it's like, what did I do wrong? And it happens all the time. What that mother wife needs to say is, uh, 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 you know, I'm sometimes I'm scared we shouldn't have had children. I mean, I'm just impatient. I'm frustrated. Uh, and, you know, you know, and I'm scared sometimes about how tired and exhausted I can be. Well, if you take that father husband out of the cross here is of doing something wrong all the time. If he loves you, he's going to say, you're a great mom. You're just tired. But that doesn't happen. People don't bear their neck. They bear their teeth. <laughs> so one of the things I've been saying to entrepreneurs, but frequently male entrepreneurs, and when I say this, you want to flip a switch in your marriage and make it what it was like when you first met. Uh, and they say yes, because it's really, it's really doesn't feel that way anymore. So the prompts I give them, and what I'm loving is that you and I are sharing actual prompts, actual tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I love the insight behind it, but the, 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 the world is too busy. And here's what you say if you're that busy entrepreneur. Uh, you take your spouse aside and you say, have I ever made you feel that I don't respect you or like you? Mm -hmm. That spouse is going to go, what? Yeah, have I ever made you feel like I don't respect you or like you? And it's going to be quiet, which is a, a, a bold yes with capital fonts. And then, and then, and then the next thing you say is, "Take me to a moment when I was at my worst." So you're inviting them to get stuff up and out and off their chest, as opposed to suppressing it down deep, eating too much, drinking, you know, yelling at some poor person who's a cashier doing the best they can. And so when they bring that up, you don't. You may not even remember it because you're so busy and you say, look at me. I did that. I've done that on more occasions than I, I'm, I'm proud to admit. You deserve better than that. I'm going to fix it. And I'm sorry. That can flip a switch in a relationship. What, what I tell these entrepreneurs you'll see the hurt underneath. You'll see the hurt inside the eyes of the person that you once adored, but you can't do a bait and ditch. I mean, if you have a second chance, you got to mean it when you say, I'm going to fix it. Yeah. yeah. But these things just don't happen. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm in entrepreneurial communities. You spoke at one of them and the, there's almost a false pride about how many divorces they've had, but the smiling is a cover up for, you know, I'm really a failure in my life. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't care how my business is doing. You know, I've been married three times and, you know, and I don't give my family undivided attention and now my kids are turning to drugs. So, uh, uh, but I just wanted to share that because we're, uh, this is, this has been an amazing conversation. You know, one of the many, many joys of this is that uh, it, it's applicable to personal relationships and professional relationships, right? It's you were talking, once again, these masterful, you call them prompts, you know, these conversational catchphrases, these dialogue samples, right? So we don't just say, don't let them get under your skin. Well, like, what good is that going to do, right? No, what can you say to, so the, have I ever made um, you feel I don't respect or like you? Take me to a moment I was at my worst. Look at me. I did that. You deserve better. It's in, I'll, I'll use a work example and then a personal example, because when I'm doing talking on eggshells, tongue fu workshops, we talk about when people complain, don't explain because explanations come across as excuses. They actually make people angrier because they feel we're not being accountable. 
And so instead we take the A train, um, you know, A for agree, you're right. The meeting was supposed to start at nine o'clock, you know, A for apologize. And I'm sorry, you ended up waiting. A for act. And I've got that information that you had requested. We can jump right in. We can make a decision, you know, as within the next hour, if you'd like, whatever. And the A train expedites complaints and, and explanations aggravate them. And I'll always remember a man pushed back and he said, why should I apologize if I didn't do anything wrong? You know, why should I apologize if, if something went wrong, but it wasn't my fault? And so we talked through a situation that had recently happened. And he said he had gone to pick his wife up on a Friday night. He was supposed to pick her up at six. She worked downtown. He was, And so there was an accident on the freeway. It's gridlock. His phone is battery died. He can't call her. He said, he said, by the time I got downtown, it was almost seven o'clock. He said, from a block away, I could see my wife pacing up and down the curb. Says, I pulled up. She yanks that car open. She says, you are supposed to be here an hour ago. He said, don't blame me. I've been stuck in traffic all this time. She said, how was I supposed to know that? She said, I didn't know if you, you know, ditch me, you know, if uh, you'd forgotten, if you whatever. And he said, get off my case. You know, it was out of my control. He said, you know, another night on the couch, right? <laughs> but then it was like, why should I apologize though? It wasn't my fault. So I've got, you know, a way to respond. I bet you do not do first though. Go ahead. And then we'll talk about what we can say in that situation. Well, one of the tips that I give, if you want to nip an argument in the bud is, uh, if you can, first of all, be mindful, oh, we're having an argument. And just asking yourself the question, what's it like for the other person right now? You'll discover that you can't be curious and furious at the same moment. I did yeah. this with my wife many years ago. We were having an argument, training tit for tat. And then I paused and I thought to myself, I don't think she likes where this is going. And so instead of coming back at her, which I, you know, uh, I unfortunately still you know, occasionally prone to do, I said, uh, do you like where this is going? You know, because going is a night on the couch. Because mm -hmm. uh, I knew she didn't like it. She's not someone who enjoys arguing. And she said, I can't stand it. I said, yeah, I thought so. Uh, do you have any idea how we can keep it from going there? And she looked at me and smiled and she said, no, but you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is I funny. guess that that's a pattern interrupt if ever I heard one. That's a pattern interrupt. You know, it's you've heard the phrase, you know, with this gentleman in this public workshop, I said, have you heard the phrase, we can be right or we can be happy, right? <laughs> And you also know Dr. John Gottman's work about the number one pre, uh, precursor to divorce is, in one word, contempt, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and often, you know, when we are refusing to apologize because, doggone it, it wasn't our fault. And, you know, it's that we, we will quickly move into contempt, the eye rolling, why are they blaming me, I couldn't do anything, et cetera. And as you said, there are four words, I think, that can move us from contempt to compassion. And you know what the four words are? How would I feel? Mm -hmm. How would I feel if I'd been standing on that curb for an hour, right? Wondering, Absolutely. is he in some ditch somewhere? Did he forget? Did he blow me off, right? And it really does have this transformational power to move us from impatience to empathy. And then, and then as you said, if we understand that an apology is not admitting fault, an apology is commiserating with the other person's inconvenience, right? Imagining what it was like. And then if we say, I am so sorry you ended up waiting for so long, not knowing what was going on, as you already said, she's a lot more likely to say, well, you couldn't do anything about it. And now they're out to a pleasant evening instead of another night on the couch. Absolutely. I'm writing an article uh, with someone, uh, which we hope will get into HBR and various titles. But uh, uh, one of the titles is uh, uh, Juris Culpa, Wrongdoing and Wrong Admitting. Oh, 
interesting. And we talk about it's possible that the legal profession in telling clients to never admit they're wrong because it increases liability and retaliation, mm. it may be that that has crossed over into personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And often saying to someone, I'm sorry, inf inflames them. It feels patronizing. And mm. one of the reasons it's better to say uh, in matters of the heart, I did that. I was wrong is because it enables the other person to let go of their anger. Whereas saying, I'm sorry, feels like you're making an excuse. And we talk about how, you know, we just see so much on television. Uh, there's so much uh, in the news and there are, many of them are lawyers. And we talk about how Bill Clinton uh, during the Monica Lewinsky, he never said I'm wrong. He said it was wrong. Yeah. And 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 uh, that kind of thing. Here's something I also want you to bring up, uh, you know, in, in your work, because you're out there more than I am. I see a lot of, and, and many of these people are a little bit on the spectrum, you know, and they can be men and women. And one of the things that they don't get is uh, uh, if they feel I don't intend to hurt anyone in my family because I love them. I don't intend to scare anyone in my company because I wouldn't have them in my company if I didn't believe in them. Uh, so if any of them feel scared, it's their problem. So uh, I think what, and it's really tough to stick it in because there's someone I'm working with who, who says, all I want is for my family to be happy. And, it's really true that that's really his deep intention, but he has minus three emotional intelligence. <laughs> and so he can't understand why they're so upset with him when down deep he really believes uh, that, you know, he loves them and he wants the best for them. And they will even admit, we know he loves us. He doesn't take responsibility for the way he communicates. You know, and I've been telling him, it's still not sinking in. I say, you know, we have a little control over what we say and how we say it. We have no control over how it's heard. And when you say things the way you do, it is heard with hurt and anger. But my, but it, it's, it's still, I mean, he's, He's been so rewarded by the world, you know, by his genius in this, in this one lane that's made him, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, it can't be wrong because I'm getting rewarded. And it was interesting. I think it's getting through because in a recent Zoom talk with him, he sent me a video. He said, what do you think of this? And it was a video of a billionaire who was really unhappy. And he said, you know what real success is? Real success is having grown children want to spend time with you. Wow. And it's not just about what you pay or do for them. And the billionaire was talking like, I don't have that success. Mm. Well, we are fortunate, Mark, in that we do, right? And we are so we're on the front lines of understanding that when it all is said and done, that when we look at our life, that uh, Shakespeare said, be wealthy in your friends. And we are wealthy in our family. And there's no unfinished business. And we're close with the people we care about. And they actually want to be around us. And uh, that puts a smile in my heart. I know it does yours. <laughs> You know, about what you're saying, that is an opportunity to bring up ISA and interpersonal uh, situational awareness. Because uh, when I was writing this book, I certainly took some classic techniques from Tung Fu and updated them for email, social media, et cetera. And I wanted to make sure I had new ideas that I didn't even mention when I first wrote the book. And one of them, Desmond Tutu said, we've got to stop pulling people out of the river. 
we need to go upstream and figure out where they're falling in, right? And that is what this book is about, is thinking upstream. It's reading the room so we can lead the room. And as you just said, and I'll tell a story on myself, because um, right out of college, I had an opportunity to work with uh, Rod Laver at his tennis facility on Palmetto Dunes in Hilton Head Island. Now, I was young and I was eager and I was full of ideas and so forth. Now, I represented them at the board for our resort. So, um, you know, those first few meetings, Mark, there I was, you know, <laughs> all my ideas and we can do this and we can do this and this. And finally, thank heaven to Dale Schutte, who is DGM of the Hyatt there, Palmetto Dunes. And he pulled me aside after a few meetings and he said, you know, Sam, you might want to sit on your hands. And I had not heard that expression before, Mark. I said, what's that mean? And he said, everyone in that meeting is senior to you and you have done more talking than they have. He said, it is, it is going to be smart and strategic for you to do more listening than talking. And only after you have honored them, listened to them, then when it's appropriate in that setting, you know, ask yourself, is it good timing? Is it welcome? Is it additive, et cetera? So before you open the mouth, ask yourself those qualifying questions. And if what you're about to say isn't welcome, isn't good timing, isn't additive, then put a sock in it, right? And so when you're talking about the client and he's saying, well, I'm just telling the truth. You know, if this is hurting them, that's on them, right? I tell you, Mark, we both agree. We have a responsibility to ask about the reception of what it is we're doing. And if it is harmful, even if that is not our intention, chances are we could say or do something that will be welcome, that will be additive, that would be good timing. And that is interpersonal situational awareness. It's not only a career maker or a career breaker, it's a relationship maker or breaker as well. Let me ask you, do I owe you an apology? Why is that, Mark? You're the guest, I'm the host. I've talked at least as much as you. Mark, we're looking at each other eye to eye, and this is a heartfelt no. And hey, Mark, we talked about a side-by-side -side conversation, right? Side-by-side -side conversations are free-flowing, are back and forth. It's not, you know, many podcasts, 95% guest, 5% host. Not when the host is as masterful and has as much to add as you do, and all I know is I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope everyone listening has too, and that they feel that we were both sharing stories and insights that they may be able to resonate with and take action on, and that will make a difference. Well, thank you. So I, 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 I'm, uh, you know, it's interesting. I have something I call the Dead Mentor Society. <laughs> So my eight mentors have died. The last one was Larry King. I used to go to breakfast with him with a quirky group and uh, at the delicatessens of Beverly Hills, and we were just a quirky group. And and then before him was Warren Bennis. And every now and then, you know, I'll feel like I overstepped my boundaries. I messed up. I talked over my guest, mm -hmm. and and I have something called the Dead Mentors society and i will call upon them mm. I, I think i'm going to call upon larry and say larry wake up and he'll say what are you waking me up for mark uh, yeah. <laughs> uh i think i overstepped my wonderful guest sam horn well what did she think well i asked her and she's fairly honest and she said i hadn't but you know down deep I uh, I wonder, and he'd say to me, "Mark, you're so neurotic." <laughs> yeah, well, what did she think? Mm -hmm. Do you think you think you're dead to her in the, like they say in the Jewish religion? Do you think no, no? I think I, I think we actually deepened our friendship. Mm -hmm. I, I think she might even want to do some things together. We talked about Mark, put a sock in it already. Let me go R.I.P. I mean, you know, I'm I'm hardly cold. Uh, next time, pick one of your older dead mentors, please, please. I'm I'm just, you know, let me go back. And and then what happened? And really, I call upon my dead mentors when I think I've messed up. 
and I cross over into missing them. And when I miss them and I was grateful for the gift of their time and they're believing in me. In fact, when I coach people, uh, I used to call it John Wooden coaching. I said, I want, and I only, I'm only interested in coaching you into becoming someone that other people want to steam from. Because if you become that person that was their best boss ever, they're going to want to honor you. They're going to do the right thing and more, not out of guilt, but because they want to honor you. You know, one of the lesser known books by John Wooden is about, I think, the power of mentoring. Hmm. And he talks about Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, people he's never met that mentored him. And he had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton talk about him. And you could tell that if you were to ask those players, when you think about your entire career, what was the highlight? You could tell when we played for Coach Wooden. You know, because they uh, they wanted his esteem. Mm, wow. So uh, I call upon my dead mentors to say, uh, you know, uh, Larry, will you still love me in the morning? You did okay, Mark. Let me go rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Mark, if we can run with what you just said, because uh, Jeff Bezos said the only danger is not to evolve. And I think you have just uh, communicated something that I feel as a speaker is that, you know, we've both been doing this for a while. And uh, 30 years ago, the model was, you know, professor like I speak, you listen, you know, I'm the professor, you're the student. And it was very, so if we're juxtaposing this over on the left is sage on the stage, right? We're the expert, we're the professor, we're the teacher, we're the knowledgeable ones, and you take notes and listen and learn. I honestly, I've gone over to the right side now, is I believe that I'm a facilitator, not a teacher, that I have an equal, even a, a bigger responsibility to create a community where people have an opportunity to connect and contribute. I am not the only expert in the room. There are many experts in the room. And, and it is that my mom said, whoever does the most talking has the most fun. And so if I do a workshop and I talk for 60 minutes, I probably had fun. What about them? They were almost held hostage. They were, it was passive, right? So, so giving people's opportunity to participate, connect, contribute, community is my responsibility. And I think as a podcast host, the old model of you ask a question and then I talk for five minutes, you ask a question, I talk for five minutes. I don't think that's equitable. And it's and so what we've done here, personally, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have too, and I hope people have. And whether they're podcast hosts or speakers or teachers, that I think more of the Socratic model of this free flowing give and take where everyone's participating, everyone's contributing is a rising tide model. Well, I love that. You know, we could we could go on forever, and this is this is already the longest episode. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but will you still love me in the morning? Uh, absolutely, I will. <laughs> Ditto back at you on steroids. So, where can people find more about you? And and they're going to want to engage with you or get engaged to you. I don't. I'm not sure if you're single again or whatever. But go ahead. Where can they find hey. out more about you? It's real easy. They can go to samhorn.com, S-A-M-H-O-R-N.com. And by the way, uh, you and I are both pragmatists. We talked about the top tools. So I actually have these one pagers with words to lose, words to use that we can put by our laptop or by our refrigerator to help us catch and correct and use more of these words and responses on the right instead of the left. So just go to samhorn.com and you'll, you'll find it there. And I, I hope that people find it interesting and useful. And it, um, you know, Catherine Graham of the Washington Post said, to do what you love and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? 
Only thing more fun, Mark, is to do what we love, feel it matters, and get to do it with people we enjoy and respect. Well, I'm going to end by quoting Jack Nicholson with Helen Hunt in As Good As It Gets, which is too old a movie for most of our listeners, but you and I saw it. And the most famous line from As Good As It Gets was when Jack Nicholson said to Helen Hunt, and what I'm saying to you, Sam, you make me want to be a better man. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Uh, please share this. Um, please seek out Sam. Um, she's so, you know, she, she seamlessly goes from wisdom to smart to practical and it's seamless and she'll make your life better. She's made my life better. So everybody take care of yourselves. Let those wake up calls come in. Don't beat up anyone. Call up a dead mentor if you need to uh, say hello to them for us. And until next time, everybody take care.